I'm going to start with a trivia question. I hope that you can get it. I'll give you 10 points if you can. Uh, what is the fifth shortest book of the Bible? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Jude. Okay, very good. Jude, this is the fifth shortest book of the Bible. 406 words in, uh, excuse me, I'll make sure I get that right. 461 words in the Greek that are translated into 641 words in English, or at least in the ESV Bible. That may be a little different depending on what translation uh, that you use. It is a relatively obscure book placed towards the end of the New Testament. We always enjoy reading Jude or coming to Jude in our daily Bible reading for two reasons. Number one, you can read it in like three minutes. Uh, and then number two, it means you only have one more book to go and then you accomplished your goal of reading uh, the Bible through in a year. According to one source that I read, it is the eighth least popular book in the Bible. And, and not least liked, just least popular. And by that, least referenced and looked up and, and things of, of that nature. I'll give you another trivia question. What is the least popular book? book in the Bible. Habakkuk is close. So close. That's so close. Obadiah is the least. Is the least. Oh, you were close. You were right there with it. Uh, one author uh, described it as the most neglected book in the New Testament. I find that interesting. I, I guess maybe my own study, maybe that is is, is the truth, but we're going to do our best to change that as we look through uh, the book of Jude in the next uh, several coming weeks. I don't know, maybe next four, maybe five weeks will depend on kind of how we uh, divide it up. But apart from the third verse's admonition to contend for the faith, it's not a book of the Bible that we read very often or even is referenced very often, but it has some rich stuff in it. Jude's uh, one letter or one uh, chapter letter is very relevant, not only in Jude's time, but in our time as well. And we will, we will see that because, some very appropriate lessons, because Jude warns against false teachers who pervert the grace of God. They live immoral lives, reject authority, and deny our only master and Lord. Sounds like he's writing to the 21st century, doesn't it? And for number two, he encourages us to remain in God's love by building up our faith, praying in the Spirit, and waiting on the return of Jesus Christ. The same encouragements that we need even today. And so you'll find that the book of Jude is extremely, extremely relevant. So I want to jump right in. If you haven't already, open your Bibles to the book of Jude. Jude begins this way. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called... Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude addresses his readers like, he, like most uh, ancient letters do. They typically begin with an identification of the one writing or sending. There's some kind of identification of his readers, then some kind of blessing usually pronounced on those that would receive the letter and read it as well. And so Jude follows this pattern. He expands on it just a little bit, modifies it just a, a little bit. He not only identifies himself and his recipients, but he also provides a, a brief description of who he is and a brief description of those who would receive and read his letter as well. He writes as a representative of Jesus, to those who are followers of Jesus. And then he modifies the greeting just a little bit with a, a pronouncement of blessing or a prayer of blessing, I think we could accurately say, uh, of spiritual blessings on his readers. So Jude identifies himself, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. You can tell a lot of, about a man by the way he describes himself or the way that he, he speaks of himself. You can tell what he thinks of himself and the way that he portrays himself simply by the way he describes himself. And Jude calls himself a servant. The Greek word there is doulos, which can mean servant, but there is a more accurate, I think, uh, translation. Not because I know Greek, just because I did a lot of reading. Uh, and that translation is the term slave. 
A doulos is a slave. This is a person who has chosen to give up their complete total rights to themselves. They have chosen not to govern their own lives. They have chosen to live a way where they will not make their own decisions. And so Jude describes himself this way. He is a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ. He has given himself to Christ. He is allowing Jesus to uh, govern his life. He's allowing Jesus to make his decisions. And so he's given up his rights to his life and presented his life to the foot of the cross. He's given his life to Jesus. This title describes his subservience to Jesus as Lord. But contrary to the way we may think of the word or view the word slave, this title comes with a certain amount of honor. And I say that because its Hebrew equivalent that we find in the Old Testament is used to describe people like Moses and David. And the, the Jewish readers who, who Jude seems to write to, they would have understood that. They, they would have known the category of people, the kind of, of other men in the Old Testament that Jude is identifying himself with Great people, saints, Old Testament saints like Moses and David. And so Jude, uh, and, and both Paul and Peter as well, describe themselves in the New Testament as slaves of Jesus Christ. And so Jude writes as one who has wholly and completely given up his life and his rights and has chosen to serve Jesus as his Lord and Master. I think we can accurately say Jude is happy to be a slave of Jesus Christ. He considers himself to be blessed. And this becomes even more impressive when we keep reading and he describes himself not only as a servant or a slave of Jesus, but as a brother of James. We looked at this briefly last week, and so we'll look at it briefly again just by way of reminder. As we study this, James is the one who wrote the New Testament letter of James He's the one that we read about in, in Acts and even Galatians who becomes a, a great pillar, a prominent leader in the church at Jerusalem. As we keep reading in Galatians, he, this James is a brother of Jesus. Which makes Jude, if he's a brother of James, James is a brother of Jesus, which makes Jude a brother of Jesus as well. But he doesn't refer to Jesus that way. He refers to Jesus uh, or himself as a, a servant of Jesus. And we see a little bit later as Lord and Master as well. And so the Gospels tell us that Jude and his brothers, they were not believers. At least uh, when uh, Jesus, before the crucifixion. Matter of fact, we're, we're told in John chapter 7, if we, we read the first few verses... Not only were they not believers, but they seemed to, to mock and kind of make fun of Jesus and the fact that he claimed to be uh, the Messiah and Lord. They ridiculed him and, and taunted him. Uh, they, they mocked him, John uh, chapter 7. But at some point, his brothers, Jude included, changed their mind. At some point, they came to see Jesus for who he was, the truth of, of who he is and who he claimed to be. I believe the catalyst for this change came as... Perhaps they watched their brother be crucified and the horror and the sorrow that came along with that. And then just a few days later, they uh, see Jesus, their brother, risen from the dead, alive and well. And so shortly after uh, the, the resurrection, he became a believer. Look at Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Starting in verse uh, 12, we'll read through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Here's the, the they, here's who they're speaking of. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, son, uh, uh, Matthew, excuse me, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James, all these were with one accord. They were devoting themselves to prayer. And so we, we would expect the 12 to be there. I mean, that's who uh, 
uh, witness Jesus ascend into heaven. Jesus is the one that gave them the command, go back to Jerusalem and wait there until, you know, you're in due with power up on high. But look who else is there. Together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Again, we're not too surprised by that. And then as he finish it, and his brothers. So some point after the resurrection, we're even told in 1 Corinthians 15, as um, uh, Peter and John saw the, the resurrected uh, Jesus, that, or, that one of the women was told, go tell James, his brother. And so it's after the resurrection, when they see Jesus alive and well, that they believe and they, they come to uh, the, the faith that Jesus, our brother, the one that we were raised with for decades, he is who he says he is. And so they humbly submit themselves to faith to the brother Jesus. Absolutely fascinating. And so Jude puts his faith in his brother Jesus as the fulfillment of the scriptures and the long-awaited uh, Messiah and he becomes, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we looked at last week, a traveling uh, teacher and missionary spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And so Jude appears to write, he describes himself, now we get into his readers, he appears to write to Jewish Christians, those that, that would know the Old Testament, because over and over again in this short letter, he makes a lot of allusions to the Old Testament. And so, uh, at least to some Hebrew history, but Jude refers to his readers as those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. First, he describes them as the called. This is a, a divine proposal to die to self. You know, Jesus says, if anyone would come to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me in Luke chapter 9. That's this idea of being called. But I think Jude has more in mind than just the invitation because he's talking to people who have by faith accepted this call. They responded to this call in faith and they have received forgiveness of sins. They are now children of God, part of the church, the body of the saved. And Jude is, is writing to those now who have eternal life. They've aligned themselves, their thoughts, their hearts, their purposes with God and they are presently experiencing the joy of his mercy, peace, and love. And he refers to them as the beloved and the father. Over 120 times in the Psalms, the psalmists speak of the steadfast love of the Lord. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. The root of God's gracious work of calling these people and still calling us today is based on his steadfast love. God is love. Paul tells us that there's not anything that can separate us from the love of God. The word also carries, this, this word beloved, it's not the agape, it's, it's a form of that, but it carries the idea that not only they are loved, but it's this idea of being delighted in. That they are desired. Doesn't that make you feel something special when you know that someone desires you? That they delight in you? That they find joy in you? That's what Jude is saying. The Father delights in you. He finds joy in being your father. He finds joy in the fact that you are one of his children. He desires you. He wants you to draw near to him. There's nothing more than, what, than, than uh, God wanting than you to become one of his children. And that's the idea that Jude is getting across here. But then he says they are kept for Jesus Christ. God not only takes initiative in saving us, because there's nothing we could do about it ourselves, but he also preserves us in faith. Verse 24 tells us he's able to keep us from stumbling and present us blameless when Jesus returns. Peter says we have an inheritance that's uh, kept in heaven for us and that God is guarding us by our faith. This seems to be that same idea. Aren't you thankful for God who not only takes the initiative to save you, 
but he has the power to keep you saved. And it's not up to you. God saves us and keeps us saved. Think of the, uh, I think Morgan mentioned this last week in his Bible class. We think of, of the time when you were immersed into Jesus and that moment you came up, all your sins were washed away. You don't have the time to do anything wrong just yet. And how beautiful that is, sinless. I think that's what Jude is saying. God has the power to keep you that way. You were bathed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I think of, you see the cartoons, you know, where a, a person's having a bad day because the cloud is following them and wherever they, they try to get out from underneath the cloud and the rain and wherever they go, no matter how fast they, they run, the, the cloud is still following them and it's raining on them and it's just a dreary day. Think of the opposite of that as a Christian, though. And everywhere you walk, it's a good day because you're being bathed in the blood of Jesus. Constantly forgiven. Perpetually forgiven. Never a moment when you're not forgiven. That's what he's saying. You're kept. You're preserved. You're safe. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We serve a God that not only takes the initiative to save us when we didn't know we needed to be saved, but he has the power to keep us saved once we realize we can't do it on our own. How beautiful that is. And that's, who, that's what Jude is saying. He says, you're called, you're beloved, you're delighted in by the Father. And not only that, but he's keeping you from when Jesus returns and he'll make you stand before him blameless in spite of how you try to mess it up. How beautiful and wonderful that is. And then Jude says a prayer of a blessing. He says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude prays that his readers are filled with mercy and peace and love. This is, is interesting because it's a little different than most New Testament letters. Most New Testament letters don't have mercy. They have grace in its place. And although they go hand in hand, and they're, they're very similar, they're not the same thing, but they're very, they're very, very similar. They, they go together. But mercy isn't typically found in the New Testament greetings. Uh, perhaps Jude substitutes mercy for grace because we keep reading it is, is grace that these false teachers are perverting. And maybe he, he switches them out. I don't, that's speculation. I, I don't know. But maybe that's the reason. But he's, he's, he grants mercy. or He asks mercy on them. This is the idea of compassion. Mercy and compassion are very much related. It's the idea of showing kindness and concern to people with the desire to alleviate the problem that they're in. And working, not just desiring, but working to do that when you can. And, and this is what... Jude is, is wishing upon them and hoping. He's praying uh, for this. We are in constant need of God's mercy. And Jude prays that they would be overflowing, that they would be filled with mercy on those who doubt, verse 22 of Jude, and then show mercy with fear in verse 23. It's a key word, I think, in, in the book of Jude. But he also wishes and prays for peace for them. Peace is a, is a very Jewish concept coming from the Hebrew word shalom. But peace is the holistic well-being that can only be experienced as a friend of God. As someone who's been reconciled to God. You know, James tells us anyone who makes himself a, a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Peace is experienced when you become a child of God. And it's an overwhelming peace. It's a, it's a whole body experience, it, it, so to speak. Because it, it's not uh, based on, on circumstance. It permeates circumstance. It, it overflows uh, just the, the, the circumstance. Because you know you're a child of God. You're a friend of God. And you're bathed in the blood of Jesus. It's, it cannot be taken from us by the world. But then he prays love upon them. This idea that, that just... The love of God, for God so loved the world. We know, we understand that. We know what that is. The Christian worldview is to be saturated by love. Everything that we do is because God loves us, and in return, we want to show the world how much we love God and how much we love them as well. 
And so this, this blessing of love motivates us to do everything that we do. And it's by this love that the world will know that we are followers of Jesus. And so Jude desires that they be filled with these divine blessings. This word uh, multiplied, uh, it suggests the idea of, of being filled to maximum capacity. This idea of, of overflowing. And so Jude wants all uh, mercy, all peace, and all love to be multiplied to them ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times over. To the point that they're overflowing with mercy and peace and love. And I think it's necessary because if they're going to contend for the faith among these false teachers, they're going to need to be filled with the same mercy that God has shown them. They're going to need to have a life of peace and they need to be motivated by love. These spiritual qualities are needed so Jude's opening lines, they don't seem to be too compelling, right? Just a, a standard greeting from a New Testament ancient letter. But they have uh, contemporary relevance for us today. Two points that, that I want to make. Number one, like Jude and his readers, we're slaves of Jesus. And we are called, we are desired, and we are kept. And we are given perpetual mercy, peace, peace. And love. In our culture, the word slave uh, conjures up some very negative thoughts, and, and rightly so. Uh, we have corrupted, man has abused and corrupted the master slave relationship to the point of dehumanizing a fellow man. It should not be the case. But that's not the case with the one who created us in his image and recreates us in the image of his son, Jesus. Jesus said, if, if we're going to be his disciples, we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and, and follow him. That's the idea of, of wholly and completely and totally giving up all of our rights. We don't get to direct our own steps. You know, the wise man said, there's a way that seems right to us, but the end is death. We, take counsel of that. The wisest man that ever said, or ever lived, said that. Uh, let's listen to it. And let's give up our lives and become slaves of Jesus. Let, let's, let's, let him, let's let him govern us. Let's let, let him and his word make our choices and our decisions. And when we do that, we don't have anything to worry about. Let's submit ourselves to God. James, the brother of Jude, the brother of Jesus said, Submit yourselves to God, James 4 and verse 7. That word submit is the idea of, of arranging your life under God. I want to align myself with Him. I want to live life to the fullest, the way that He's purposed my life to live as a slave of Jesus Christ. It's a master slave relationship of unprecedented blessings initiated by God. And Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, verse 44. God started the whole process, and he'll finish the process. We are slaves of Jesus Christ, who are called, who are desired, who are kept, and experience constant mercy, peace, and love. And number two, it is because of God's saving initiative that we live in his mercy, peace, and love. Reflect on, for just a moment on the mercy that you receive from God. Reflect on the mercy that you received yesterday. Reflect on the mercy that you will receive today. Reflect on the mercy of God that you will receive tomorrow. Don't you need it? Aren't you thankful for the mercy that you've received for rebellion, for ignorance, for flagrant selfishness? Aren't you thankful for that? That God in his love had, had compassion on you and kindness and saw you in that and did everything that he could by giving his son to alleviate that. Because there's nothing you can do about it. Reflect on the peace that you have. Because you are a child of God. And you have a father in heaven that keeps close watch and guard 
over your soul and your salvation and that you have no, nothing to worry about because your sins are forgiven and being forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And so trust in his faithfulness and not in your ability. Reflect on the steadfast love of God that you have, that he continually and richly pours out on you. There's nothing that you can do at this moment to make God love you any more, and there's not anything that you can do to make him love you any less. He loves you, period. When you begin to wrap your mind around these blessings, when you begin to, to really meditate on them and contemplate them and what your life is with them and what your life was without them, what keeps you from giving up your life? What keeps you from taking everything that you see to be yours and handing it over to Jesus and saying, I'm a terrible steward of these things. Please take my life and direct it. Show me what is right. Show me what is good. I can't do this on my own. I've tried numerous times and all I do is just mess it up one time after another. I can't do it. Here's my life. Take it. Save it. Redeem it. Restore it. Let me be yours. Show me what to do. What keeps you from doing that? In the opening lines of this short letter, Jude encourages us to give up control of our lives, enjoy the blessings of allowing our God to do what he does best, to take care of us and direct our lives. He knows what's best. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jude, his readers, and even us today, we serve a God whose good purpose cannot be overthrown. People have been trying since time began can't be overthrown it can't be stopped if you listen to Jesus and you follow him we are promised that the Lord will keep you until the day Jesus returns and you will stand him bef before him blameless what a day that will be if you're a child of God I encourage you to embrace the spiritual reality that you are a slave of righteousness called by God delighted enjoyed by God and kept by him if you don't follow him if you're not a follower of Jesus let me relay to you the best news ever and it's very simple by faith by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ you can become a follower and your sins will be forgiven You'll be raised to walk in new life, filled with the Spirit of God to help you direct your life. And all you have to do is respond to Him in faith. Repent of your sins. Let Him change you. Let Him turn your life upside down and shake out everything that doesn't need to be there. Be immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to walk in new creation. Forgiven. Filled with the Spirit with nothing to worry about as a friend and a child of God. This morning, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, you're ready to do that. Um, we're, we're ready. We, we want you. We encourage you to do that. Maybe you want to just talk or study a little bit more. We are more than pleased to do that. Maybe you need the prayers of the church or something you're struggling with. We would love to pray with you, pray over you, and help you walk through life so that you can know who Jesus is. Whatever your need is, come forward while we stand. And while we sing.